Welcome, Mark DeCrepo here from lettersandbooks.com, Rusty Wheels Media. I'm here with the lovely A.M. Hounschel, author of Contractual Obligations. That's me. Contractual Reality, also authored by myself. And Letters Never Meant to Be Read, Volume 2. He's also in Volume 3, which is coming out in October. Check us out on Facebook, Letters Never Meant to Be Read. Also at lettersandbooks.com, our catalog. Welcome, A.M. Hounschel. What are you doing with your screen? What do you mean? What am I doing? What happened to me? I don't know. You're in Topeka. Uh oh. <laughs> you Look, I'm, I'm working with what I got. You're working with what you got. All right, yeah. Tonight, we're going to be talking about publishing and whether it's prudent to pay for publishing or whether you should send out query letters all the rest of your life or to go to the small press or you should fork over your firstborn or your first $10,000 or what. So, Today in publishing, there's so many options. It's a very exciting time to be an author. Would you agree, Anne Mountchell? It's a very exciting time. Right? I mean, there's more competition, so that's exciting. Oh, yeah. Yes, there's more competition for sure. Anybody can publish a book. If they can write one. Not everybody can publish a good book. So, or a book that sells necessarily. So today in the publishing world, there's so many options for a young author. Um, I'm going to try to not spin in my chair as I talk about this, but it's really hard because I switched chairs. I had a fixed chair before. Some of you see my our other videos. I got a nice old leather chair and I cannot spin in it. This one I can't. So I'm going to try not to do it. Today in publishing, there's a lot of different options. <clears throat> you can go with a traditional publisher, meaning you're sending out queries, which is basically messages in whatever format they want to go along with your manuscript or part of your manuscript that say, please look at me, please publish me. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to spend your time doing that, that's all well and good. Personally, I mean, I'd rather write another book. What about you? Most, most of them probably won't take your unsolicited manuscript. So you're probably thinking about a different step one. You're probably yeah. going to need a, an agent first. Yeah. And look, you I'm, be taken not, seriously. I'm not interested in being doomsday for anybody at all. And their dreams. If you have a good idea, you think it's you think Random House wants it or something. By all means, go ahead. It's a nut house yeah. up there. I'm gonna warn you. It's a madhouse, and the way they handle manuscripts is just crazy. Um, bureau, you know, bureaucracy is just they get bigger, and it just gets crazier. <laughs> That's one thing about human nature that I love sometimes. So you can roll the dice and do it. Uh, you can send out letters and get rejection letters and 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 do the traditional thing. Nothing wrong with that. Um, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. I, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say, you're never going to get in. You're never going to do this. It's not something I was ever really interested in. I personally would rather write five more books than write 500 query letters. Um, and eventually someone can come to me. So eventually I have a big, a big enough platform, big enough sales that I got my next book coming out and maybe I send it specifically to a traditional one traditional publisher that I know um, will have some interest in it. Or, or a handful of them, and then and then I go from there. Do I have the capability of doing, you know, sending out query letters and doing all that stuff? Sure, yeah, that's what I went to school for, okay? But not for everybody. And in this day and age, while you're sending out query letters for the next year and getting rejection letters or not, um, your competition or your colleagues or <clears throat> your nemesis. 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 They, they're writing five more books and putting them out there. So that's one route, right? The other route is to self-publish. And that's certainly an option. Uh, and that's what a lot of people are doing. Uh, your genre will dictate whether or not that's somewhat the status quo or if that even matters. All right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with self-publishing. There is a learning curve. So there's things that you need to figure out. <laughs> it's quite the curve. <laughs> we'll, we'll ask Alex about it in a minute. But there's things that you need to figure out on your own. So you just you were just an author, okay? Now you need to learn how to be an editor. And editing your own stuff isn't always the best option. So not only that, you have to learn how to be a cover designer. Then you learn you need to learn how to do interior layout. <clears throat> or you can pay for all these things a la carte, right? Maybe maybe you know how to do the interior design um, in InDesign. Maybe you know someone. Yeah, you know somebody who can help you out with that. Um, maybe you pay for your cover design or or something like that but you you end up not just an author anymore right 
So Alex has had some experience in self-publishing. I've had some experience in self-publishing. It can be a good route to go. It can be a very cost-effective route. You get more, uh, <clears throat> more royalties per book, which is good than if you're going with a traditional publisher. Um, you sell 10,000 copies of your own self-published book, you're really into something because you're getting five, six, seven dollars, depending on what the cost of production is. There's a lot of avenues out there with uh, print on demand, so it can be a very good way to go. We can talk about, you know, we can get in the skinny of that in other videos, but Alex, why don't you go ahead and tell us about some of your um, uh, successes and failures in self-publishing, some of the pitfalls to avoid. Um, so first and foremost, one of the most interesting parts about self-publishing is that you get most of the control or all of it. Um, but that also means that you're limited to all the things, you know, like you were saying, yeah. like, I don't, I don't know how to design a cover or, you know, and I know there are people who probably do who publish books, right. Yep. Who self-publish their own books. Um, and it also means you can overlook mistakes even when they're pointed to, out to you, which is kind of a an interesting power to have like mistakes in your manuscript or mistakes in, in what the layout mistakes in. I, I, I think that it's an interesting power to be able to disregard small things. And even with some self publishing routes like create space and Lulu, you have the complete power to go. I hate this manuscript and this book. I'm rewriting every chapter after chapter nine and resubmitting it. Yeah, you do. Because you basically have a placeholder. Like, you could take down the book you have on Amazon that you put through CreateSpace and put a different book inside of that slot. Like, a completely different book, if you really wanted. You could. Yeah. And so, so that's nice. Um, but the pitfalls. <laughs> the pitfalls. You have to be your entire marketing team. Ah, to sell 10,000 books would mean to probably tell 10,000 people with your own mouth. Maybe. Uh, sure. If you are, if you are going at it, uh, trying not to spend a single dollar, like let's imagine that, like you're only spending money on actual books. Cause there's, the, I can't even imagine just the, just a box of books. <laughs> In that case, you're going to have obviously your issues with your formatting if you can't do that. Your cover is probably not going to be too great if you can't do that. Your book still might be great, but if you're willing to not spend a single cent, you're going to have to market everything yourself. You're going to have to fix every issue that comes up, even ones that don't really make sense, like entire pages being missing from your manuscript. Um, in some cases I had, when I put it through the, the, uh, the pre-formatted word plate, it was like, Hey, this is all in a different language now. And it's not even English or any language. <laughs> it's just, everything is now just random Q's and R's deal with it. And you're probably not going to have a very good chance of getting your book in front of a bookstore, like in a bookstore. Because you did everything on your own, your one man show. That's important, right? Yeah, I mean, isn't it kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling? Yeah, it can be. Uh, so, but if you're, but if you're yeah. trying to to publish your grandfather's memoirs on Vietnam, um, and you just want it to hand out to your aunt Sherry and your uncle Joe, it's great. Good. I mean, it's great no matter what, but like, if you're not, if you don't want to put a lot of work into it and you want a product at the end, no matter how bad that product may be, you'll have a product, you'll have something. Yeah. So also when, when you're doing self-publishing, there are like, I can probably rattle off 20 implied tasks. And these are things that go along with, oh, I'm going to uh, self-publish my book. So then all of a sudden you need to learn 20 different things that you may or may not know about already. Um, and all these things come secondhand to me now, but looking back on it and they, they were steps in the way that I had to, you know, either get around, climb over. And I had to, in order to do that, I had to learn as much as I could. And so by all means, if you 
again, I'm not opposed to traditional publishing. I'm not opposed to self-publishing. Uh, if, if, if that's what you want to do and, and you think you can go hard with it and you can find some success and you have the, the diligence and the time to do it, and in some cases the money, because basically you're, you're putting up a project and it does take a little bit more than just uh, copy and pasting files or, or you know, copy and pasting or uploading files or something. There's a, there's a lot more to it. So it's getting easier and easier every day. So as new products come out, as new software comes out, um, to do covers, and we're gonna have an episode on covers uh, for for people who, who are interested in that and uh, an episode on interiors and stuff like that and the different options available now. But if that's what you wanna do, go ahead. Just know that there's some work involved, right? And if, if you're not gonna do the work, you're gonna pay someone else, an independent contractor, a freelancer to do some of that work, then there's gonna be work and or money both and we're talking about just on the production side something that alex mentioned before is the marketing side so a lot of people believe that if you go to a traditional publisher the reason that you would want to do that is that marketing is built in and to some degree that's true but you have to keep in mind that most traditional publishers if it's your first go around and they sign you they're they're not going to put a lot of juice towards your book Okay. No, because why would they want to lose money? No, because they're gambling. So Yeah, it's losing money if they are wrong. Yeah. So at the same time, though, if you're not willing to gamble on your own self, meaning put money towards your own marketing, and again, uh, that's <clears throat> I can think about production, what, what, it what it takes to bring a book to market, and I don't just mean the Kindle version. I mean the Kindle, paperback, hardcover, and uh, audiobook version. Uh, so that's, that's the production side. When you're talking about the post-production side, the marketing side, uh, there's even more steps involved. Um, so if there's 20 steps on the production side, there's like 120 steps on the, on the marketing side and you can fall in a lot of holes there. You can waste a lot of money. You can waste a lot of time. You can get frustrated. You can give up book campaigns. We have book campaigns. Look, you can spend a lot of money on a Facebook you can spend a lot of money, you know, uh, buying ads, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, there's just a lot of predatory. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I strongly believe in capitalism, but there's just a lot of predatory businesses out there that are like, hey, you know, forty nine ninety nine, we'll we'll tweet your book for thirty days, you'll be rich and famous. Like, and that's just not. That's Except just not no hard. one's following those Twitter accounts. Yeah, all those Twitter just accounts are just straight garbage. Yeah, so that's just not really how it works. There, there's a lot of pitfalls out there. There's a lot of, lot of traps to fall into. And you get this sense of like, I'm taking five steps forward, 10 steps back, you know, and nothing's happening. And in the meantime, you're not writing another book. You're not writing another book. One of the best yeah. marketing things you can do for yourself is write another book. You have more yeah. to talk about. People have more to find out about you. You have a back catalog. There's more substance. Write five books. Realistically, you're not going to, if you're self-publishing, unless you've got like, you know, Mr. Monopoly behind you, toting money bags, like bringing it to a PR firm, able to spend a publicist, a traditional style publicist, which won't look at you unless you got five grand. Like, unless you're willing to, unless you got that going for you, it's going to take you a while to, to develop a following, to build readership. And the worst things that you can do is be out there trying to market, buy my book, buy my book. No one's going to buy it. It's only one. And <clears throat> you're going to be, no one's going to listen to you eventually. So the best thing you can do is write another book. All right. So let's go to the real meat and potatoes here. Wait, hold up. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. To be fair, I want to pull back on the, you know, kind of, you know, talking smack on not spending any money, right? And Oh, you, know, not, you got to spend money. No, of course you do. Or, you know, obviously put in the effort to learn how to do something, which is valuable in itself. Yeah, learn a skill. But um, back to the having all the power. It allows you to, it allowed me to write something like running out of time. Like even if 
cleaned up and shaved and showered, I don't think that that would be anything a actual publisher would want to touch. No. So Alex, A.M. Hounshall here is a absurdist author. So you have a different take on this and that there's not a, there's not a, a whole, whole lot of representation out there in the traditional publishing world. No. So, so yeah. having the capacity to put my absurd humor into the universe in itself is kind of a reward for going the, you know, self-publishing route. You know, I can release something like running out of time that's unedited, unrestricted, stream of conscious, you know, crazy. Um, and like I can have the audiobook narrated by an Australian woman who sometimes slips into a Scottish accent. <laughs> and I could do that in theory all for free. And that's yeah. something that's exposure that I could never get if I tried to pursue a traditional publisher. I'd be yeah. wasting so much time trying to get a publisher to listen to me about this nonsense. Meanwhile, I have more books in my catalog, more jokes, you know, and you've read Running Out of Time, not to talk about it more. But like, my point is, is that like, that's something that I have to show. Yeah. And some people might get a kick out of it. Some people might hate it. it yeah, is but at least you can see it. Yeah, at least you can see it. Um, <clears throat> and you have things like ACX, Audio Content Exchange, where you could post a manuscript and people can just put in audition. Yeah, and, and those are for audiobooks to be put on Audible, and I highly recommend that. I don't know why so, you wouldn't do that. Audiobooks are, are a huge market. Just, it's just not, it, it's not like, you, you know, today there was less audiobook listeners than there were yesterday. There's just more. And there's going to be more as, as we go forward. We're so, on the go society. So, so by pushing two buttons, you know, the Kindle and the ACX button, I could have a ebook, a, like an actual print book and an audio book all at once. It'd be easy. Um, well, it, yeah, easy if you know what you're doing. So you gotta, there are like 20 implied tasks in there that you gotta do in order to make all that happen, right? So it's not, sure. it's not just like you're pressing one button and everything, everything magically appears. Editing is really important, and I highly recommend that if you spend any money, if you're doing self-publishing, if you spend any money at all, um, that it be on an editor. An editor, well, you really need you really need to have a decent cover designer if, unless you're you're savvy with that. Um, but an editor is really important. It's di very difficult to edit your own stuff. Okay, it's especially true. after you're looking at it for six months, a year, two years. You know, it's a hundred thousand words and by the time you, you start reading it and editing again, you've looked at it so much, you're just, you're not finding anything. Yeah. Your mistakes are muscle memory. You've been filling in the blanks for a while. Yep. So any, any young author, I always recommend that, you know, if you're going to put up money towards anything, find a good editor, find somebody you can trust, find somebody you want to work with on different projects. I have about four or five editors that I work with. I use them all for different things. Okay. I don't use, I don't have one go-to person yet. Um, maybe I'll find that person. It'll be awesome. But uh, there's also different kinds of editing. You know, we'll have an episode just on the different types of editing and, and what you should expect from an editor. But let's get down to the meat potatoes of this thing where it's about pay to play. Okay, so there's a lot of vanity type presses out there. And what I mean by vanity is that back in the day, not that long ago, actually, 15, 20 years ago, uh, if you, you could publish your book and not get, not get accepted by a traditional publisher, of course, this is before KDP, this is for, before CreateSpace, this is for uh, Kindle, you know, Kindle paperbacks, this is before Lulu, before Ingram Smart, Spark. Um, back in the day, uh, if Alex wanted to publish a book, but no one was accepting it, he could potentially pay money, uh, get it published, get it laid out, get it, get it printed, He'd have to order a certain amount. So he might have a garage full of his books and then it's up to him to do it out. Um, very, very famously, Ch uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, was done this way because nobody would accept it. Um, and, and there's plenty of successes. There's plenty of just bad books that were made uh, just because somebody had the money to do it or didn't have the money to do it, put on their, put on their credit card or whatever. And they had a, uh, a garage full of books that never sold. So uh, jump to this era that's still occurring. So that, that model is still there. I mean, I, <clears throat> again, I, I, I believe in capitalism. Um, I believe in choice and 
this is this is one choice so you can go on to and i this was going to be a shaming video i i was going to shame and i might do it in the future um i was going to go you know go on here and have a list of five of them and just shame them publicly uh and talking about how predatory they are and, and what they're doing so these all run the gamut you can find one that's like uh just someone who's knowledgeable or not knowledgeable <laughs> that charges you $1,000, $2,000 to publish your book and get it out there on the market and we only accept this and blah, blah. Um, and then there's some big names out there uh, that, that do this and you can buy a platinum package and for 10 grand and get your book done and all this stuff and, and, then, and then they market it um, to <clears throat> some degree, right? Uh, so this, you could spend anywhere from two to 15 grand before Alex talks. I'm going to talk about why this may be a good option for some authors. All right. I'm going to talk about why this may be a good option for some authors. I don't necessarily believe in this. I don't think it's a good way to go personally. All right. And as the owner, as the founder of a publishing, a publishing company that is non predatory, I do not accept money from strangers. Okay. Um, we'll get to know each other first and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have contracts and do royalties. So, uh, letters and books.com and Rusty Wills Media set up in a more traditional style. Alex is reading his book on camera in a more traditional style. All right. And I do not accept money up front. There's, th that is not my model. That's my choice. But I want to talk about why some authors might do that. All right. I want to talk about a nonfiction author. All right. Let's say you're a photojournalist, been all around the world, have a lot of cool stories to talk about, covered a war, something like that. All right. If you're having trouble with the traditional publishers and getting accepted and you don't have a lot of time or uh, don't want to make the time or don't want to get into that to that um, world of having to do all this stuff yourself, you're afraid you're going to mess it up. Um, then sure. And, and here's why I say nonfiction because nonfiction, while the cap on fiction, so you can, the sky's the limit when it comes to fiction as far as selling out. All right. On nonfiction with some, with some exceptions on nonfiction, there's a cap on how much you're going to sell that book, but nonfiction can sell more consistently. So yeah. sometimes with fiction, it's either hit or miss, hit or miss, right? And until you establish yourself as an author and they, you know, you, you're an endearing fans start ordering all your books. Um, you, you might have two or three books that are just, you know, kind of failures in the market. It doesn't mean they're bad books. They just might be failures in the market. All right. Um, but for nonfiction, it might make sense because if you sell 10,000 copies, let's say, Let's say you were able to sell 10,000 copies by going with a pay to play a vanity press. Okay. So you're paying two to 10 grand for someone to put out your book. Um, it, it takes off. So, so let's, let's say you spent 10 grand total. You spent anywhere from two to five on the production with a, with one of these companies that, that I don't, that I refuse to work with. But let's say you spend two to five on the production and then you spend your own five grand on marketing. You hire a publicist or something like that. Um, okay. So you, you said $10,000 investment and a year of time. All right. Putting this book together. If it sells 10,000 copies and you're getting a decent amount of royalties, meaning that company you paid isn't also taking royalties, like a lot of royalties. So that would be terrible. That'd be so dumb. Um, but let's just say that you're getting $6 a book in royalties. Okay. So you sell 10,000 copies. Alex shaking his head. Okay. Let's say you're getting $3 a book in royalties. He's shaking his head. Yes. $3 a book in royalties. All right. You sell 10,000 copies over the first year. You've made $30,000. You spent 10. You've made 30. Good investment, bad investment. I would say for most people, that's a pretty good investment. I mean, that's not, that's not so terrible. Yes. You had to put the money up front. Um, so that money came from somewhere. I want to stress to our listeners, our watchers here that, uh, if you spend money on cover design, if you spend money on marketing on anything, 
that is inevitably going to take away from your writing time because you're not making money as a young author usually. So how are you making that money? You're doing other things, things other than writing usually. So it's just something to consider. Here's why I wouldn't go, and Alex will talk more on this, but here's why I wouldn't go with a vanity press and it's pay to play and all that stuff. For one, they come in all shapes and sizes, you can get totally screwed, okay? Some of them are so predatory that all they, they don't, they're not, they don't care about selling books one bit. They, they care about getting a thousand authors to sign up for a thousand dollars a piece. That's how they make their money. They don't care. They don't care if you, they don't care if you sell two books. They got their thousand dollars from you. That's all they ever wanted. All right. And they, a lot of times you don't have a say in the cover design or whatever, or sometimes you do. And it's just terrible. All right. So to me, that is taking advantage of a person. And I don't like to see that as much as I like choice and I, and I like capitalism. I, I don't like when people get taken advantage of in the open marketplace. Um, and I try to inform as much as possible. And that's why we're here, you know? Um, so Alex, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with working with uh, a vanity press or uh, a publisher you had to pay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The year is 2011, and believe it or not, some vanity presses actually take manuscripts. Uh huh. Take take manuscripts. Yeah. Um, and I get an acceptance letter, basically, like, uh, "Hey, we kind of like your manuscripts, sir." <laughs> um, it's important to note that at the time, I kind of knew what I was getting into. You know, I'm 17 at the time. Um, and I'm just really excited that I finished my first book, the yeah. science fiction novel, the superhero novel. You know, I'm just excited that at some point I might have a physical book in my hand. Yeah. You know, this is before I even thought of contractual obligations, you know, like sometimes it's just fun. Um, and I had contacted other places, um, Author House, Tate Publishing, uh, iUniverse, uh, what's that other one? Oh, Exilbris, Zilbris. <laughs> And I'm not going to tell you necessarily which one I went with, but it wasn't that list. Um, and, <laughs> and God, they had an initial call where they called me and they were like, hey, this doesn't really work like this thing. Like someone who read 10 pages or 13 pages, it felt like to call me and say, I'm an editor, sir. And this is why this book does not work. And then he's like, and if you pay us an additional $510, we'll edit the book for you, which I didn't pay for. And also, I don't think they would have done right. Um, but that's just me. Um, and I'm not shaming anyone, but everyone who called me either had a very thick Indian accent or was the most American person who's ever called me. Um, anyway. Uh, eventually I just keep getting calls like that. They'd get scheduled and they'd call me for every little detail. They'd call and be like, Hey, did you look at those, uh, those, uh, free images that you were going to design your cover from? Yeah. Like they're charging me money for this cover that's being put together with like probably an image they spent a dollar on. Um, that's actually a really interesting one though, because the lady who I talked to, she was American and eventually she felt bad for me. Like, she's like, you're 17, finished a book and you're going through us. Like, I'm going to try to pull some strings. And she actually got me a custom cover. I didn't pay for it. So that was kind of sweet. Like someone there had a soul. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just coughed, um, so I put it on mute, so I took it off. So that was fun. And yeah. I got I got my um, contract. <laughs> and it's like, it's pretty typical. You know, if they want, they can drop me in 30 days. They're not going to because they just hit a button and they print the book when they need it. Like, it's not hard. Yeah. Um, uh, they could drop me in 30 days if they want. I could drop them in 30 days. I only make 20%. That's I think, terrible. Yeah. 
Uh, I pretty much never sold a single copy. How much? How much did you pay them? <laughs> More than five hundred, less than a thousand. Wait, did you just say five thousand? I didn't pay them. It was a gift. Yeah, Mark. I know. I didn't want to talk about it. Five thousand dollars. Now, hold up. Two things of note here. Okay, I'm ashamed of it. Oh, <laughs> um, no. Anyway, uh, two things of note. Well, okay. three. Three things of note. I'm waiting. I get. I did get a hardcover edition. Something that um, Create Space and Lulu don't do. Um, something that we Lulu does, does do it. Okay. Something currently uh, Rusty Wills Media doesn't do that we're looking into. That's not true. We have a hardcover edition of Stop That Wedding right now. Really? Yeah, we'll have a hardcover edition of Contractual Obligations and when you stop talking about it. <laughs> um. Uh, well, you know what I mean. It's something at the time that was exciting and great. Yeah. Um, I have it has a real uh, ISBN. I didn't have to pay for it. Well, I did pay for it, and hey, I did. got you paid for got that a, ISBN. Uh, let's just I, let's just make it clear. ISBNs are ninety nine dollars. A uh, one hundred dollars, one hundred bones, um, and they sent me the actual like copyright information. Like I have my actual like sent for me to me from the library of congress copyright okay do you know how much that cost i don't want to talk about it ever you basically just have to write something for it to be copywritten anyway really yeah but to, to get the actual thing is 35 dollars. well five, 55 dollars electronic registration 55 dollars. cool sure so we're up to 80 dollars that i you know <laughs> um what was i gonna say gosh God, I know. It's actually, it's designed pretty well. The layout's okay. Um, yeah. I, it's definitely a product that's not done horribly. Did okay. But, I would, I would, I would hope not. No. Nope. Did you have it? Did they edit it? Mm, no. Who edited it? <laughs> no one. Well, me. Uh, Seventeen-year-old oh, me. Yeah. Oh God, it's bad. So uh, you have, is this thing still out there? Yes. Oh man. Under a different pseudonym. That's probably for the best. Yeah. Um, I wrote a sequel and I published it through Create Space, interestingly. Um, anyway. So one more thing. Okay. How could it get any worse? Oh, it could. <laughs> All of those people I inquired with still constantly call my uh house where I used to live at the time constantly like every month i get a call from exilbris i get a call from iUniverse, universe i get a call from author house every month just trying to get me to buy more copies it's been what 16 years no That's terrible. no it's been seven years eight years whatever it doesn't matter years. they're probably gonna keep calling me 16 years from now all right look so so that's that's a terrible scenario and i want you to keep in mind that there are people who will shy shy away from there are people who care where a book came from the pedigree okay yeah so that's that's, true. that's something to think about if you're if you're going with a vanity press um i i don't think the average the average reader who's stumbling upon your upon your book is necessarily going to care but um, so some of the avenues of approach and, and some of you got to think about the future of your writing career as well. So yeah, that's why I started going by my real name to, to, to be like a devil's advocate here to, to at least offer, you know, a reasoning for this uh, a reason for doing this. I think if it's a business decision, then by all means, go ahead and do it. If, and especially if you're doing nonfiction, if you're doing like a nonfiction, uh, marketing book or business book or something like that like by all means if it's a business decision go ahead and do it if you're if you're a um, if you're a professional speaker motivational speaker or something like that and and a book is just a side of something that you sell in the back along with other materials or software or something then 
fine. If it's a business decision, fine. I, you know, um, if you want someone else to take care of it all and you just want a box of books, you know, there in the back of your speaking engagements at universities or whatever, fine. So as, as a business decision, okay. But as an artistic decision, as a, <clears throat> as a, I'm, I'm going to make a career as an author decision, probably not the best route to go. And there, there's, yeah. there's, you can find horror stories, you can find success stories in any of these scenarios we're talking about. All right. I want to get on to the, the model that I like best and the one that I created at LearningBooks.com and Rusty Wheels Media. And that's the, that's the small press. Okay. And on, not all small presses are the same. So keep in mind that some small presses, like the one that I first worked with for my first book, uh, they charge you a small amount. Okay. Not like a vanity press. They do, may do a little bit more in marketing. They may charge you for editing or something like that or offer that as an option. Okay. You can bring yeah. your own cover design, stuff like that to some of them, but, but, but they, uh, some small presses will, will charge you. Okay. And so they're, they're acting like they're a traditional, you know, small press or a small publishing house but they're actually vanity. So they, they may not charge you the five grand or the 10 grand that some of these big corporations are charging you, but they may charge you 500 or $600 or $200. Yeah. And you only get 10, 20, 12%, 15%, you know, a dollar for every, uh, for every uh, Kindle book sold. So y y you're, you're being taken advantage of on both ends, okay? For me personally, if I was ever going to pay to have a book publisher, which I won't, but if I was ever going to do that, I want to make sure that I'm getting the most amount of royalties on the back end if I'm, if I'm paying. Okay. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to pay $5,000 and only get 20%. That, that is crazy. That, that means that my scenario where I was comparing, you know, and talking about traditional publisher versus you know, vanity press and business decision. That means that that's a poor business decision. Any way you look at it. There's a reason why I shook my head. Yeah, so there are small presses out there, and some of them may be niche. So there may be horror ones. You may be able to fit in there if you if that's your thing. There may be you know uh, small presses that are dedicated to post apocalyptic, and they have a fan base, and they have good marketing efforts, and come join our yeah. family. And that's that, a good point. Yeah, hopefully, you know, and and look, in in true crime and detective and romance, there's there's a whole bunch of them, and. You just need to do your research, do your homework, so you're not just signing up with whatever, which one accepts your manuscript, all right? Well, heck, local scene. Yeah, be, because look, it, if you're like, uh, you know, I, I'm not good enough, and these people say that I am good enough, so I'm going to go with them because I'm yeah. trying to sure of myself, you know, uh, because they're the only ones that would take me, and I'm going to take whatever deal they give me. Like, no. There's there's a whole bunch of fish in the sea out there. There's a lot of small presses. Uh, I, I if you're gonna go with small press, I don't recommend paying. Like, I don't I don't think that's a good model. That's not our model. That's not how how I run things. So, I want to talk a little bit about how we run things at Rusty Wheels Media. I think a small press is a good option. Um, and and he, here's a few reasons why. One is that if they're a little bit niche or or just at least you know either really niche so they're just just a horror or just a zombie small press or something like that cool um they can help you out they can they can help you with your cover design or do they do the cover design yeah um, and 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 they you, you're joining a family in a way okay here's here's why i started rusty was meeting here's why i started letters and books.com and and we have the letters never meant to be read obviously um anthology and we're, we're growing our family daily. Okay. We get new manuscripts in. Um, and, and here's why I wanted to do it because I, I, you know, as a person, as a founder of a company with employees, like we, we have, I'm spending my time on other people's work. I could be writing my own books. I could have 12 books out. Right. But I'm trying to do something because I'm trying to get away from what Alex felt when, you know, he spent $5,000 on his first book. What I felt when I went with the small press and I spent, you know, $500 um, on editing and stuff through them and things like that. And I just didn't, I didn't feel like they did anything for marketing whatsoever. I would have rather spent, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you hire an editor, but I would rather spend some money, you know, I'd rather have gone with someone that was 
a little more savvy with the marketing and things like that. I would have rather shopped around a little bit more. The reason why I did it is that I wanted to create a traditional style model of small press that doesn't require upfront money from authors. Okay. Well, that means that when it comes to cover design, editing, book layout, like we're, we're a traditional model, that means we, we cover everything in house. So that means that we're choosing whether or not to work on your manuscript. Okay. We're choosing to let you in the family and we're investing in you. Some people call yeah. it a gamble, but we, yes, a little bit we are, right? Publish 10, hope one hits big and that kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. There's some aspects of that. Maybe it'll be yours. I don't know yet. Right. So, but in my, the way I look at it is that if I accept an author's manuscript, all right, it, it may, it may not be perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I look to see how coachable they are. I look to see um, how, uh, if they're open to constructive criticism, if they're open to changing things here and there, I'm not, you know, I'm certainly open to their, their ideas, um, their reaction to that. And, and I'm looking to see, are, are you trying to build a brand that's you or, or, your, or your books? Or is this a one-off, you know? Because I need members of my family so we can help each other out. And as, as we go, I felt like the godfather there when I said members. Yeah, of a little bit. Right? But, <clears throat> but the thing is, is that if you, can, if you can build a team around yourself so that you can write more books, okay? Because at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. Like as far as the legacy is concerned, if you've made an entire four different series of books and, and you have all these fans and you've touched lives and stuff like that. And people, um, people pass that down for generations to come. If you're spending all your time marketing or you're spending all your time on cover design or you're spending all your time on interior design, you, you might not have as much time to do that. Right? So, what I wanted to do was create an infrastructure so that, hey, I don't, I'm not interested in taking all your money. I'm not, I don't want any money up front. Put your wallet away. That's not what I'm interested in doing. Let me check out what you got. So let's see your manuscript. Let's let me look at it for marketability. Let me look at it for, you know, what genre, what categories is going to fit in? How is this going to work? Right? Can I and chime then, in? Let me finish the sentence. Okay. Then you can. And then, uh, let me invest in that. All right. Let, let me see how, how we can make that work together and how we can market that together. And, and let's give this thing a go. So that that's, that's part of how I look at it. Go ahead, Alex. And I kind of like that model. You also like really support indie public, uh, not indie publishers, indie authors. Yeah. Like you're constantly buying books that people are marketing themselves on Twitter. Yep. You know, just to read them, to support them. You know, maybe it's not something you're going to be interested in. Um, but you still want to support them because they wrote this for a reason. They put effort into it. So it really feels like you care, which we come back to the family thing. Yeah. And because it's a family, you know, we, can, we accept and decline people because we want people who can make us more whole. You know, your success leads to my success. We build on each other. Yeah. I just want to elaborate a little. If you can find a small press that, that can do that, it might not be us. You, you might find another one. But if you get one that treats you as a person, like calls you and, and isn't trying to sell you something, like then you know you have something worthwhile. And the first thing you should ask uh, any, any small publisher is, what are you doing for marketing? And when someone asks me that, you know what? I tell them a different thing every time because the market is constantly changing. So if they have their tried and true ways, and sure, we have some of our tried and true ways, but every book is marketed the same. You know, a letters anthology is gonna be marketed differently than a, than a YA choose your own adventure style book, okay? It's just, <clears throat> it's not cookie cutter, it's not, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's not simple either, so some thought, some time has to be gone. Marketing begins from like day one, how that book looks on the inside, how that book looks on the outside. That's marketing as well. And so you need to ask them, what do you do for marketing? If they don't have any good answers and you should know at least a little bit enough to be dangerous, you know, and that might be watching 20 YouTube videos just to know, okay, what, what are people doing? What, 
What are some of the strategies and stuff, right? And if they don't have a good answer for you, run. All right, just, just go because it's not going to be worth it. You might as well self publish and just, you know, hope that it, hope that something happens. That's not going to work either, but it's just <clears throat> for small presses, a lot of them try to, they try to say they have marketing or something like that. And each book should be taken and its own merits and considered who's the audience for this book. How do I reach that target audience? If, if your publisher isn't talking about stuff like that, well, for this book, I, I think one of the, some of the, I have some pretty good avenues of approach for that, right? And this is what we do on standard with every book. You know, if someone asked me that, I would, I would say, I would tailor the answer to their book, first of all, because a cookbook is going to be marketed differently than, um, than a sci-fi novel. So sometimes I, I might say some of the same things for each one, but that's always changing too. So my staples for marketing are always changing. I'm investing in books. I'm investing in authors. Uh, I'm investing, like we're investing our own money in, in, in authors. I do not take people's money. I've had authors try to give me money before. I said, no, that's just not, it's just my principle. That's just not how we're, how we're doing things. That's not, I'm investing in you for, for, for the next 20 years, hopefully. My, our, our contracts are not predatory by any means and we no. and we and we know what we're doing and you know what we're learning more every day so i just just to be clear like letters never meant to be read volume two outsold volume one in the first three weeks of production and that's because i learned some things that first year with letters never meant to be read volume one and i letters volume three is about to come out in october and <clears throat> i i'm very excited at, at, at the possibilities of that so Alex, do you have any, do you have any other thoughts on, on working with uh, a small publisher or uh, Rusty Wheels Media in general? Let's get the real inside scoop, Alex, the Alex perspective. I mean, Alex I is an have... author who I met on Twitter. We wrote a book together and I published, um, obviously, I mean, I published his, his book, Contractual Obligations. He's holding it up there. All right. Cover designed by Joseph Studios. Hey, it's pretty good. It's pretty I'd, good. I dare to say excellent. Not going to lie, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I convinced Alex post production. This thing was written, it was edited. I was going through it, you know. Um, and I convinced Alex to market this thing as a young adult choose your own adventure book. How's that working out? I mean, when I think right now it's still in it, the upper tiers of its category, interactive storytelling. Good, and for a long category. time, yeah, and for a long time it was like in what, 80 or 60,000 for all like fiction or no, fantasy novels, something like that. Yeah. So it does really well. It's regularly on the first page of its category, which is always, oh, yeah. always good. It's Did it make it to number two? Yeah. Not a lot of reviews, but you know you have a different audience there. A lot, a lot more ebook sales than anything else. The the audiobook version is going to come out, and I'm really interested to see what happens with that. We have a crazy uh, actor for that, so I want to do it in the British accent. I really wanted a Birmingham accent. This guy bailed on us, so I'm using this other guy, John Paul Rogers. So if you're out there, John, make sure you get this book done because I'm waiting on it. Um, and then when we were doing all of our books for free to uh, announce. Uh... What were we announcing then? Uh, we were announcing. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Um, didn't it didn't it get like a thousand downloads or something? It got more than that. So I, you got like four thousand dollars over. Oh over god! Hours, like a thousand dollars a day. So, and look, a lot of people they're like, "Why would you give away books for free? What's wrong with you?" Well, look, that's that's uh, you know four thousand people that have never heard of Am Hounchel before and now know about Am Hounchel. And yeah. It's never a bad thing when you're, when you're just starting out or, you know, um, sure. When you got 10, 15 books and, and you're a little bit of a household name or a regional name or something, um, there's, there's not as much incentive to do that, uh, unless you just want to do it. But, um, there's, there's interesting campaigns. I'm always, I'm always reinventing the wheel as far as campaigns go. I, you know, I, I have a, <clears throat> 
I have a, ca a marker board. This marker board's on this, the only purpose for this marker board is for, is for a month campaign, one book at a time kind of thing. I, I read it all out, take a picture and we go with that plan. And uh, I, I, I stagger. So I have, a whole, it depends on the book, you know, give me a manuscript. Let me take it to market. You know, let me bring it, uh, get a decent cover. Let me bring it to market. And, um, and I'll have a plan ready for, for marketing that baby. And look, as we, as we get more authors and letters, and to be read series and, and we, and we, um, we add people to the family. We we just added Melissa Klein, a, a seasoned romance author who, who we, we have, you know, a, a three year strategy with for, uh, for marketing and production to go from romantic comedy to serious romance, romantic comedy to serious romance. And she came from another small press that was taking a higher royalty, wouldn't let her choose her own covers, you know, and they were kind of predatory in that she, she signed with them for X number of years, those manuscripts, or, or she can pay $2,000 to get them back, right, and bring them over to us. She doesn't have audiobook versions. She doesn't have hardcover versions. She had no say in the cover. She hates all her covers. How is that? How is it if you're working with small press and they're like, oh, we choose the cover, like we're the, we're the experts, right? How bad are you going to feel if on your Amazon product page of your, of your author page, you hate, hate all your covers? Like that is just a nightmare. To me, I, I couldn't imagine dealing with that. So you either go, I mean, that's true for a traditional publisher, right? Like they're going to choose make all those choices for you. You're not going to have a lot of say. So, um, yeah, it's just, as we add to the family, as we add people, uh, we're, we're only going to get bigger and stronger together. And we're, our letters never meant to be read audience is really a really, first of all, those readers are, are excellent. I love them. Right. And I love everyone that sends in letters. Those letters are beautiful. We cherish them. Uh, and, I want nothing more than, than every year to, or, or twice a year to release letters never meant to be read. I'm, that's just what I'm going to do from now until when I die. That's just, that's what's going to happen, right? I'm not, there's not going to be a year where I say, ah, I don't know if I can do that. You know, I'm, I'm too busy. Like, that's just something that I'm going to do every year. Um, I want to do, I want to get to where I'm doing them twice a year. I always have, but that audience is not getting any smaller, right? Each time it's a exponential jump from the last audience. So as you're thinking about who you're going to go with, I'm not saying that we're the best option. I'm not saying that, you know, you should, you should always go with us, but you know, shameless plug. I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll go ahead and share my screen. It's the letters and books.com. I feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> so look, I mean, letters and books.com, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was talking about, right? Why pay to be published? Some vanity press is often charging an exorbitant amount of money, which never really costs you writing time. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was talking about is on here, right? So you can kind of get, get to know us a little bit. You get to see, you can see what our submission process is. This stuff is going to be like, we're, we're constantly adding things to this website and enhancing this website. We're going to have a, for indie authors, we're going to have an Amazon title generator uh, pretty soon. But, um, yeah, so, you know, pretty no nonsense submission. Um, and then we also have submissions for, for the letters that are meant to be read always ongoing, right? We have contests, we have stuff like that, but we have deadlines. Sometimes if you want to get into this publication, you know, I got to fix that because, uh, on markdcrepo.com, it has a date on there for, for submissions, but. I want to thank, uh, I think we're on submittable. So I want to thank everybody who participated in that contest and everybody who's doing that stuff. Again, if you look on services, like I don't say, Oh, two ninety nine golden package for blah, blah, blah. No, I say, Hey, you know, here's one vendor. I'll, 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 you know, just studios near and dear to our heart. Right. Hi trolls. Hi Daniel. Um, but we're, you know, as I, get more people that I'm working with, you know, mask of the red pen is one of them that's going to go up here. Um, some voiceover actors and actresses are going to go up here, some links to those. Um, so as we build our family out, there'll be more into the services, but you will, you know, until, over my dead body, will you see 
bronze, silver, gold package, platinum package. Like that's just not, that's not what's happening here. You could go gemstones, ruby, sapphire, emerald, diamond. <laughs> I try not to name names. You know, I'm really trying <laughs> hard not to do that. Uh, recoils our blog um, and our other cool videos. So, you know, check us out, send us something in, um, you know, be on the show. Who cares? Right. Uh, come on and get to know us and stuff instead of um, you could see my screen during that, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm looking right at it. Okay. Oh yeah. Stop sharing. That's right. We're using zoom. I, I get, we use Google hangouts a lot and, and these other things. So I, yeah, come on board, check us out or just make sure you do your homework, whatever, whatever route you're going to do, traditional publishing, small press, vanity press, whatever you're going to do. I'm all for it. Publish it yourself. See how that works. See if you like it. If you like doing that, if you like that game more than writing, which some people don't, um, then go with a small press. If you don't like the game more than writing, if you like, just want to write books and have a good solid place to send them to that, you know, you're going to be taken care of and treated like a good human being, then come to us. It, otherwise make sure you do your research, right? Anything else, Alex? I mean, I think we pretty, I try to be as diplomatic as possible for this. Uh, I really wanted to do a shaming video where I hated on some of these pay to play places that charge you five grand and give you nothing. I give you something, but it's not what you want. I think the main takeaway here is that there's positive and negatives to all yeah. free fast books or four, depending on how you cut it, right? Yeah. Um, surely the pay to play has more negatives if you're writing fiction. But ultimately, I think that a small press, it kind of ends up hitting the sweet spot where yeah. if they're right for you, they can brand you right. Um, they'll treat you like a person. Like, heck, I'll call you sometimes and be like, hey, I have an idea. And you'll be like, that's a really cool idea. But work on those other things you've talked to me about that are already good ideas. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, pursue your, pursue your dream and your passion with a traditional publisher. But like you said, the problem with that is that you're going to be doing that for X amount of time. And that's time you can't, you probably won't be writing as much. Yeah. When that's you could just have a trilogy. Back. Yeah. You can't yeah. get it back. Yeah. And look, if, if you can call your publisher and they answer the phone, that's a pretty good sign, right? If they're willing to do book coaching, if, if they're willing to coach you along a little bit, I mean, I, I, I do that. I, sometimes I think, you know, I should charge for, for, for coaching people writing their books. And then I'm like, you know what? And, and sometimes, you know, dollar signs flash in front of me and I'm like, think about how much money I could have charged or I, I could have made over the years. You know, coaching people writing their books but I already get paid to do that I'm a college professor for writing like I already get paid to do that I don't I, I don't need to do that here um, I I, I want to meet meet good people I, I want to meet uh, emerging authors I want to help them out and in the end they'll help me out too because maybe we'll write, write a book together who knows right <laughs> who knows I'm always open to that Alex you always open to collaboration with other authors it's fun heck yeah Heck yeah. All right. With that, we'll, we'll leave. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I hope you learned something. I hope you can go out there and make some more informed decisions. Uh, this is Mark DiCupo signing off with AM Hounchel from lettersandbooks.com, RWM. Have a good night. Have a good night.